you've heard you've heard about JD Vance fucking the couch, right? Yeah, yeah. The AP said that uh, you know he they put out a fact check. They were like, uh, people saying he fucked the couch. That's three. <laughs> three pants on fire or whatever and then they uh quietly retracted it for some reason uh who's to say why that that's what i know look okay so what i would like to say about that is like you know how i'm gonna phrase this you know so that we Mm -hmm. can't get in trouble for libel is that the actual accusation is that he said he'd fucked a couch in hillbilly elegy okay okay so Apparently, he didn't say he'd fucked a couch in Hillbilly Elegy, but I can't say that that means that man has never fucked a couch. So can he really post an article that says J.D. Vance has never fucked a couch? But why would... We need to hook him up to a lie detector, which is not a real science and it's not real. But also, I just think it would be funny. Why would you even bring that up? Was that <laughs> okay? So, like, I think this is actually the miracle of like. How Wait, twi- was this was this from that fucking interview he did with uh, 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 Red Scare or whatever? Or was it, or was this something else? It's something else. It's actually a rare example of how Twitter still has the sauce. Is that somebody? Sorry, somebody somebody <laughs> tweeted mm-hmm. that. Uh, you know that uh, actually let me see if i can find the the tweet uh that you know this is awesome podcasting look i've just got over having a fever i can do this shit however i want um and, but anyway someone had tweeted it and uh it's very specifically said uh that uh the that like he had fucked a couch and talked about it in hillbilly elegy and it gave page numbers which was really funny so i'm just trying to see if i can find it yeah like uh because rolling stone wrote an article about it this is imagine being me okay and you're fresh off a fever and you just log on and you see everyone's talking about jd vance fucking couches and you're attempting (laughs) to get to the bottom of this like (laughs) while running a temperature right like it's it was a, a big day for me yesterday that's all yeah. I can say. So yeah, someone was like that he said in Hillbilly Elegy that he um, fucked a couch and he talked about it on pages like 179 to 182. <laughs> and now the reason why this is funny is because it like shows that, sorry, 179 to 181. Mm. Um, yeah okay thank you for the appropriate citation it's rick rude's calves wrote i can't say for sure but vance might be the first vp pick to have admitted in a new york times bestseller to fucking an inside out latex glove shoved between two couch cushions vance hillbilly elegy pages 179 to 181 (laughs) and that's where it came from Oh, God. Uh, which is an incredible bit of tweeting. It's like how one of my mates uh, shout out uh, to the online shit post left in the UK uh, started the thing about the Russian chess player uh, cheating using vibrating anal beads. <laughs> that was just like one of my mates sticking around and people like actually believe that's real now. So that's cool. But anyway, so, but what I think is kind of funny about that is that it shows that no one's actually fucking read hillbilly elegy. Right. Like, you know, everyone was always, like, jacking off about how good it was. And I was like, this is an obvious pablum, and I'm not going to fucking dignify this shit with a response. Yeah. You know, like, let's not fucking do that. Uh, But everyone was just, like, in a froth about, like, how great it was. It was like, oh, did you fucking read it? Because you just believed this thing about him fucking a latex glove in a couch, right? So anyway, that's funny. But you know what is true? What's that? I ask you. Is that J.D. Vance has searched... For women being fucked by dolphins and liking it. That's true. Okay. I want you to just... <laughs> Are you gay? I wish. <laughs> okay. If I were gay, there'd be no problem. It's no, like... what I have is a fetish that's so... so exactly. That's so awful. So terrible. That it cannot be spoken of. Exactly. <laughs> So going to SeaWorld? It's like, okay, so 
basically what it comes down to is that he tried to do like a what's this world coming to post um, where it was like, <laughs> yeah, lol. Okay, look. That's what's a, this world coming to when a man can't go to SeaWorld and <laughs> fuck a dolphin while a dolphin is pleasuring a woman? What? 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 What, what is what that? Kind, like, so he tried. So he tried to do like a you know a tweet that was like, oh, the internet was a mistake or whatever, and it's like got a video that says and it uh, shows that like dolphin like stags woman and she loves it or something like that um and uh and it's got a video and it's like raw clips or something like on on twitter except for like woman and dolphin was bolded which in the <laughs> image <laughs> so he was like clearly like Searching. He was searching for it. He, he was, was searching, searching for, for woman dolphin. dolphin, and then and he's all like, "What? The, oh, the internet was probably a mistake." And it's like, "Buddy, do you <laughs> like so your inability to use the internet might be a mistake?" Yeah. But... <laughs> so we absolutely know that, right? We absolutely know that. So that's just you know, this is how I spent my fever personally. <laughs> and I consider this time well spent. It is time well spent. Uh, you know, you can't, um, you can't, uh, Get you, can't be, you can't, <laughs> right now, you just can't beat American politics for just pure watchability. Like, yeah, true. It is nonstop. It is, we got assassination attempts, COVID. Mm -hmm. Dropping out of the race, mm -hmm. JD Vance into the race. Like, just it's just the most confusing, messed up hodgepodge of shit. Uh, <laughs> it is really <laughs> difficult to kind of follow or indeed get your head around. Uh, but I really uh... welcomed <laughs> in my adult state this week, I really appreciated the JD Vance stuff. Um, and I think it's oh, really, yeah. I think it's really interesting that he's on the ticket at all. But uh, he'd being as Republicans hate him, so I'm like, who is this for? You know, but like whatever. Well, no, some Republicans hate him. Based Republicans like him now because he's fucking um, dolphins. I guess, man. I don't. <laughs> That's know, what like, they like. They apparently, like but yeah, he no, he. I don't know. He's like a <laughs> he's a pick for like the base. Like when you think you're you're running against Joe Biden, and all you gotta do is keep saying this man can't even talk, he, you know, mm -hmm. drool dribbling down his chin at all times, and then when you have to do something else, it's like, oh, uh, please fuck. don't talk about the couch fucking. <laughs> please don't talk about the couch slash dolphin fucking. And like, please, I, I don't care that the couch thing isn't real because you know it is real. That man can't ever sit on a couch in like any public thing ever again the campaign man managers are going to be scrambling he's always going to have to be on a chair <laughs> yes that's true I've never, i haven't thought about and, that it, and you know what couches just come up a lot how's he going to do the talk show circuit yeah for example yeah. like you can't send that man to jimmy fallon or whatever no nope. no nope. right he'll get he'll get eaten alive mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. <laughs> by the Unused condom he left. In the <laughs> what the fuck? All right, okay, if you right, like, like if you like us riffing on American politics, who oh boy do I have a bonus episode for you? Mm. Um, coming sometime soon, maybe the same time as this, maybe early next week. Who's to say? We're gonna we'll see figure how it I out. Hold up, all right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Uh, three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how 
people Neither be fucking Neither myself couch. nor Eleanor have ever fucked a couch. I haven't. I've not. I've I can not. say that with all honesty. I've mm-hmm. never done that. However, some people may. And that's their business. <laughs> I personally wouldn't write it in a uh, book. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, I personally wouldn't live a life that would have people actually believe something like that uh, about me. But, you know, uh, that's neither here nor there. Hey, I'm Luke. Uh, we got Eleanor. Uh, we're here <laughs> to talk more about, uh, surprisingly, the Middle Ages and... Um, the Norman well, conquest of England and the and the anarchy that followed were the, part the, three. The average medieval peasant would have die if he fucked one couch. He like he, their mind would explode. You, you introduce the couch to them. Okay, first of all, they're like, "Wow, I, I, okay, okay, here we go. Wow, We've got like comfy cushions. Lad. Yeah, okay. I'm comfy as fuck. Like you know the whole thing, and then you've got like." Just like the the like the it, it just it makes you feel so nice when you just sit on this nice yeah, yeah. like comfy kind of thing. You chill. You can lay down a little bit, read your book or whatever. You could do that, and then when you introduce the fact that the couch can also be fucked, like the medieval <laughs> peasant's mind is just it's like that thing in uh is it reanimator or whatever where the guy's head just, goes, <laughs> just like that yeah like it's just yeah it's no it, like yeah he's a medieval peasant uh male or female king or uh slave mm-hmm, mm-hmm. each one of them they would they, they would cower before the fuckable couch they, they didn't have we're not so different in this way they didn't have fuckable couches they didn't they no. they didn't even have a fuckable chaise lounge yet no. think about that people they hadn't even evolved that far yet think about this think about their lives and how uh i don't know people are out here <laughs> fucking chairs i guess <laughs> Presumably they still I, are. To, like, I, I don't want to, you know, I, we're doing a lot of kink shaming. If they want that, ed- to edge, it. <laughs> if they want to edge on furniture, that's their business. I just wouldn't uh, be someone who runs on culture war and edges on furniture and then, um, <laughs> you know, do and, and 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 try to act like I'm all cool and normal and don't search about women fucking dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, or dolphins fuck you. You know, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm, I don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, male or female dolphins are still going to be able to use the bottlenose. That's all I'm saying. Um. Anyway. Hey. hey anyway. <laughs> before we get to um, uh, the English, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the conquest and all that, uh, we got a couple questions. First one uh, from Paul Caraba. Uh, accepting that there would have been a variability based on era or uh, region, what would a normal or middling peasant couple's wedding and celebration be like? Really curious if there's a medieval version of Shout or the Electric Slide. Okay, so we know a fair bit about this because it comes up often. Like, I mean, more specifically, I know a lot about late medieval um, weddings uh, for peasants because it's a really common art trope. Uh, so, for example, Bruegel's got some great peasant weddings and things like that, um, which are uh, Bruegel the elder and younger both do, I should specify. Um, so what you do is you have a brief service in the church and then there's usually like, especially if you're kind of getting married in the spring or summer, a big party outside for the village where they kind of set up tables, um, and everybody has a bit of a feast and they get quite drunk and they do some dancing. Uh, so in the winter, you would probably have it inside in like the village hall or something like Mm. that. And essentially everybody comes. Like everyone hmm. in the village comes and that's how it works. Uh, there are certain things that uh, don't exist then like do now. So, for example, like there's no wedding dresses and wearing white. Like, I mean, you might have a new mm-hmm. dress, but like the whole wearing white thing isn't real. Um, like that's Victorian invention. Mm. Um, and uh, you just kind of like put on your Sunday best or whatever and get on with it. <laughs> um, and usually there's just like a bit of a walk to the church, which is kind of like a bit of a parade and then on the way back. Um, and they do some cool dances. We know this the names of some dances since, you know, you brought it up like a, mm-hmm. there's something called a carol, which is kind of like a circle dance. Um, or like a line dance you see that come up a lot of the time in the paintings Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of like um, 
there might even be like some chanting with that, like a verse chorus kind of chant thing. Um, hmm. And then there's a thing called an estampi, which is kind of like a Ooh. solo couple dance. Uh, sounds that sounds fancy. Yeah, and like, but a lot of it is like dancing in circles. They really oh. like that. Uh, but there's also something called a brani, uh, which can it's kind of like um, like we don't really know anything about it except that you kind of like get get down with what's going on with the music. Um, for higher up or fancier people, they might bring in musicians like other than just like whoever is in the town. And you might bring in professional dancers and acrobats and stuff for that. And we know for that, the thing they think is really cool is like handstands and backbends and stuff. And they're like really down mm-hmm. with that. So, yeah, like it's basically a really, really highly communal um, hmm. is the thing. And it's kind of like a village type celebration often in smaller villages, um, in larger places. It'll be like your family or whatever and whoever you know. But kind of like the same thing holds true because, huh. uh, you know, peasants love an opportunity to party. Right. So they do. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, my only follow up question is, uh, did they have bedding ceremonies like uh, George R. R. Martin loves to write about in A Song of Ice and Fire? Um, so lords and ladies do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I should have specified. I didn't think the peasants would. Yeah. Yeah. Lords yeah. 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 Lords, yeah. lords and ladies absolutely do. And it's kind of like a big thing <laughs> where they're like, oh, ha, ha, ha. like up you go. And like show them in there. Now go have sex while we all stand outside the door. Yeah. While we all stand outside the door and grade you on length of time mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. moans achieved. We have a, we, they, the, you know, they have like advanced like metrics like, <laughs> like we do for like sports or whatever, you know, like value over replacement orgasm or whatever. Hey, that's for the other, <laughs> that's for the four sports fans who listen to this show. Hey Shout guys, out. What's I'm up? here with you too. Uh, hey, we spirit. both like sports. Just uh, di- you know, you do too. Yes. Um, no, I love basketball. Um, Hell yeah. I uh, actually don't care much about <laughs> baseball, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but our but our listenership, not so much. They, uh, you know, in the hey. Discord chat until very recently, my sports commentary had gone uncommented. I, I know I need to be in the Discord more often, maybe just to talk to you about sports. That's true. That's so, like, true. Luke, about, what's up? What's up, Luke? <laughs> well, my fo- see my my phone was dying and had no memory, and now I've got mm-hmm. a new phone. So oh yeah, I, yeah. So I could like download Discord again. I had to get oh, rid of things that were uh, I was not using. So you see. Anyway, you that's cool. anyway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Paul, thank you for the question. We got one more uh, from White Trash Historian who says, "Since my vampire landlord question was such a hit, I'll posit my other myth question. Since centaurs are half human, half horse, they would be mammals. So why do they nurse their? So do they nurse their young from the human half or the horse half?" Okay, so this is a great question. I want to shout out my mate, the good Dr. Philip Coker. Uh, he and I are quite obsessed with centaurs and like to talk about centaur stuff all the time. Uh, I feel that they nurse from the horse half. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Because I feel like they've got to be gestating down there, too. I see what you're saying, mm-hmm. but... You're not going to be able to carry a centaur in, like, a woman's uterus. I... True, but I've seen a I've seen a centaur woman, and the just centaur got... woman had boobs, but I don't know that I've ever. I don't know that I've ever seen like uh, a centaur with like um, udders or whatever. Look, <laughs> I feel like uh, they've got multiple sets of boobs. Okay, okay, and okay. it's like, and we got up there for show, down there for pro. Okay. Okay, okay, I feel you. I feel you. So are we so are so, we thinking that literally all uh centaur uh centaurs who identify as males, they're all hung like horses? Yes. Is that the okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's I feel like the genitalia is all horse. Okay. Mm. And the women centaurs have human boobs, yes. But I think that these are like um solely just kind of like an attraction mechanism they're not doing ah, they're not doing anything like the plumage of a um yeah. a peacock mm-hmm. a male yes. peacock yes exactly yes. Okay. exactly okay. and then if you get knocked up 
and give birth because again since the the genitals are in the horse region right mm -hmm. the uterus mm -hmm. is going to be in the horse region mm. right so, so this means centaur babies come out like fully formed yeah. like kind of ready to go yeah unlike, they, they stand know, up human baby okay, okay yeah 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 they've got they've got to they've got okay, it's gonna okay. be it's gonna be hell how are you gonna support that neck that's a good point you i don't know <laughs> i don't know I'm sure they've got something for it. They're gonna they're gonna have like some plank or something <laughs> that they just kind of strap the baby yeah. up to. But I think then also they would the breasts would develop, like the teats would mm, develop, mm. and then it would nurse from them, and then they go away again, like they do ah, on most okay. other mammals. Okay. So that's okay. my theory. What what have you got? What you got? No, I mean that's fine. Uh, like I don't. <laughs> centaurs like, I have refused. never. I've never. Uh, like I don't know. That's never like if I think of monsters, I think of like cool um, things from myth. Mm. I like the centaur is like, yeah, I guess. But like there's a giant sea creature over there. There's okay. a dragon over yeah, there. Yeah. There's a hundred thousand skeletons. Right. I don't know. Like it just in my mind, it doesn't hold the same hook. So it's not, a you know, yeah. okay. it's yeah. you know, it's yeah. not uh, like like Dracula, you know, like Dracula does. But, you know, I know that that uh, a lot of people, you know, um, have very strong feelings about centaurs and um <laughs> i don't i don't want to trammel that because when i thought about this i was like well i've never seen a centaur with like teats um you know but i've seen a female centaur uh with do not boobs. google that and I just so want to point that out all right you know what you do in your own <laughs> oh god no just, you want to do, do that in... incognito <laughs> okay, yeah like... yeah open up incognito tab say hello to your old incognito friend um <laughs> and uh <laughs> guy incognito um and uh <laughs> and yeah um you know what look if you're a monster fucker and you love centaurs um hell yeah however brother. you imagine it that's what i think good for you knock yourself out mm -hmm. other than that i'm going with eleanor's answer um you know because yeah centaurs uh fun and I don't know. I've never been like into horses or not a horse you know. guy. Yeah. Okay. No, they actually mm -hmm. scare me. Uh, well, kind of. That like, I think that's good and correct. They know? they scare me because like I don't know. Like I mean, first of all, their mouths and teeth are just oh god horrendous. Well, yeah. Like oh, it's just true. so big and a long. Uh. Um, but yeah, like I don't know. Uh, they just scare the shit out of me. Um, but I'm happy for people who like them. And, uh, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. have anything personally against them. Um, yeah, I just don't want to ride one. I don't want to die because I can just mm -hmm. see that happening. Mm -hmm. They put me on like a pony and it's just like, Pfft, and I'm, yep, broken yeah. neck. Okay. Yeah, no, I feel it. I feel it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, White Trash Historian, so much for this question. So <laughs> we you. could uh, scrape the depths of my weird neuroses. Um as we do so often here on this show. <laughs> if you want to help me um, peer into the abyss that is my mind, <laughs> by all means, please subscribe to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash WNSDpod. Uh, you could access the aforementioned Discord. Ask us questions like these. We've got uh, our second bonus episode of the month of July coming up. Uh, we're going to try and record after this, depending on how Eleanor feels. If not, it'll come out next week and everybody will just be fine with it. Um, love you guys. And, yeah, love you. But, you know, sometimes it is what it is. Uh, and that'll be on uh, recent events in politics in England and <laughs> <laughs> the United States. Whew. Oh. oh boy, that's going to be fun. Uh, yeah, so check it out. Patreon.com slash WNCPod. Five bucks a month. Uh, it'll be fun. Mm. We're nice and cool. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you should give us money. Anyway, on to the show. So last time we worked our way through most of the Norman conquest of England in 1066, getting through Duke William of Normandy's victory over English King Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings in October. Though, uh, though we often treat the whole conquest as one big fate accompli, that was largely a prelude to get William on the English throne and begin the period of English history with which we're all much more familiar. It was anything but. It wasn't a slow rolling coronation of William that bad historiography and Norman propaganda portray, but a very close run thing between five claimants to the throne, throne three of whom uh, were what we would consider worthy of it, and one of whom was technically worthy of it, which is, we all know, is the best kind of worthy. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
In fact, at the outset of the English succession crisis that followed in the wake of Edward the Confessor's death without an established heir, William wasn't even the favorite to win the damn thing. He was probably more like the third most likely to succeed if, you know, you were a sports book and you were ranking Mm -hmm. them for odds purposes. Harold Godwinson would have had the second best odds to win based solely on home field advantage and not having to leave England. Uh, Godwinson's English forces needed only to play defense on his own territory, whereas William and the Normans would have to make a successful amphibious landing, a feat which is still difficult to pull off to this day. However, even more so than Godwinson, the smart money would have been on Harold Hardrada, king of Norway. Whereas William was an accomplished warrior, general, and politician, he had nothing on the Harold Hardrada, whose name was known across Europe. If you allow me, I'm now briefly going to gush about Hardrada. Woo! As a fi- woo, as a 15-year-old, Harold uh, had been exiled to the lands of the Kievan, Kievan Rus from Norway after losing a power struggle. He became a captain in the army of Yaroslav the Wise and married Yaroslav's daughter before joining the Varangian Guard in Constantinople. There, he quickly became a commander, led forces in many battles, some as far afield as Jerusalem and Bulgaria, amassed great wealth for himself, and got involved in imperial politics, becoming close friends with Byzantine Emperor Michael IV. After Michael IV's death, however, the new emperor, Michael V, was crowned and Hadrada was arrested, either for fraud, murder, rape, or because the new Michael just didn't like him. (laughs) After a short time, he escaped during a spontaneous revolt against Michael V, uh, of which Harold quickly took charge, leading some rebellious Phrygian guard members and the mob against Michael V. The revolt succeeded. Michael was deposed and was deposed, blinded, supposedly by Harold's own hands, and exiled. Knowing it was time to get out of Dodge, Harold went back to Kiev and Rus in 1042 and began planning his own homecoming. Four years later, after 16 years in exile, he returned to Norway with a large army, retook the throne by force, defeated local opposition, and then set up a functioning economy and extensive markets for trading. Hell yeah. Because he learned something in Constantinople. There you go. So for everyone who's like, oh, the Vikings were all marauders. Well, maybe, maybe. Some were cool. Some some were cool. cool. So when Harold allied himself with Toasted Gobbinson and sailed west to England uh, with 10,000 men and 300 ships, he was the odds-on favorite to rule England. But if he wanted to rule so badly, he should have put out some goddamn lookouts to prevent his army from being surprised by Harold Gobbinson's army at Stamford Bridge and having to fight without armor. Mm -hmm. As we said last time, uh, William also didn't even have the best claim as his uh, as his story that Edward named him heir during a private conversation was likely a later fabrication. Harold Hadrada could at least point to a historically attested to contractual oath to support his claim, which was based on a real agreement made by the English King Canute, one of uh, Edward's predecessors, and Norwegian King Magnus the Great to become one another's heir if neither had children. Of course, the actual best claim lay with 14-year-old Edgar Atheling, uh, who was made king-elect by the Witan following Godwinson's death at Hastings. And yet, William is still going to come out on top after the victory at Hastings left him with the only standing army in the land, though this wouldn't be accomplished as easily as he'd hoped. The English still had one stand left to make, no matter how tragically doomed it was, before the Norman conquest was complete. Eleanor, parting thoughts on one Harold Hardrada. I wish he'd won. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. Um, I think it would be cool. What if, uh, you know, the British Isles were more within the Scandinavian nexus of things, if they'd stayed that way. Um, who knows? Uh, right now, I might have um, a more functioning government and economy. You know, what if we Maybe. had like a really mild and limited socialism? like those countries do that'd be great (laughs) um don't care for the social hygiene aspects of um uh, many scandinavian countries do care for the everybody has a lake house (laughs) question mark i could deal with that i could really be dealing with that right so that'd be that'd be cool and good um also i just think um he was the one of the most accomplished actual rulers involved. Not that like William is small potatoes, but I think there would have been a lot less genocide um, had it been uh, Harold Hardrada. 
because yeah. I feel like the English were like, oh yeah, Vikings do be taken over. So <laughs> like that's normal, right? Yeah. But the, the trouble is when your Vikings start getting French with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's when yeah. you have, that's when you have issues. So um, R.I.P. to Harold Hodrada. Morning till I join you, um, et cetera. That's what That's I right. think. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Today, we're starting uh, with the tail end of 1066 uh, from Hastings to William's coronation, which concludes the Norman conquest. Then we will move on to the aftermath of the conquest, including William's subsequent political and actual fights to keep the crown, like the revolts of the Earl and the stunning return of the Danish Vikings, which wraps up around 1076. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we will start to discuss the roughly 60-year period that followed after William really secured the throne uh, into a series of calamitous successions that precipitated the Civil War known as the English Anarchy, which began in about 1138. Woo! All right. Aftermath of Hastings. Uh, William assumed that the remaining English lords would submit to his rule following Hastings, given they lacked anything approaching a standing army, and all other claimants were dead. However, the Witan had one more trick up their sleeve as they produced 14-year-old Edgar Atheling, who had the best legal claim to the throne, mind you, and named him Edgar II, King-elect of England. With this new claimant in place, William had no choice but to take his battered army north and attempt to force entry into London to physically wrest power from the Witan and the young King-elect. In late October, there was the burning of Southwark. William okay, and wait. his... Ooh. Yep. Southwark. Go ahead. Southwark. Okay, yeah, sorry. I, there we no, go. no, it's really <clears throat> stupid. That's the borough I live in. Southwark. It's a silent U T H W. Okay. Okay. Southwark. Southwark. I just I need people to know how stupid <laughs> the pronunciation of my own borough in which <laughs> I pay council tax is. That's just just <laughs> for the Americans at home. This is how you spell this. S-O-U-T-H-W-A-R-K. Southwark. And they act like you're crazy if you say Southwark. Anyway. Hey, y'all been to Southwark? Okay. Yeah. Uh, The burning of Southwark. (laughs) <laughs> William and his army reached uh, Southwark a few days later, hoping to secure the southern part of the Bridge of London and establish a beachhead in the city so it could be occupied. But with much of the city opposed to William's rule, the Londoners weren't ready to give up just yet and mounted a heroic defense of the city. In this effort, they were led by a guy with one of the all-time historically excellent names, Ansgar the Staller. Name a, alert! Burr, woo, burr, burr. A powerful English noble and sheriff of old London town. But Ansgar didn't stop at having a cool name. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Ansgar didn't stop at having a cool name. He was also a survivor of Hastings, who had been wounded so badly he was incapable of walking and had to be carried in a litter. In spite of this, he managed to levy a few hundred warriors from the surrounding region, and with the help of the townsfolk, they held off more than 500 Norman knights for hours. Eventually, William's cavalry forces were able to secure a foothold on London Bridge, but it was not enough to withstand the continued attacks by the city folk, and they were forced to withdraw, burning Southwark as an act of terror as they did so. Opposition to William's rule was strong, both in London and across the land, but it was also largely leaderless and without an army to enforce its prerogatives, which meant that it didn't matter how heroic the defense of Southwark was, uh, Southwark, uh, the effort was doomed. Uh, Mm-hmm. Eleanor, wither the monument to Ansgar the Staller. See, you know what it should be? It What's should that? be like hedonism bot since he was in the litter. Yes, yes. Defend, the- defend the bridge. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> yeah, while he's getting, like, some guy's peeling grapes and dropping them in his mouth. He's like, defend the bridge or I oh. won't be able to get out the chocolate pudding. Oh. <laughs> no, it's like, okay, so um, in this, I did look up whether or not there were any monuments to him. And I found mm. out that there is like a Mason's Hall named after him in yes. what used to be Middlesex. So Middlesex used to be one of the um one of the counties. Mm. And it was kind of like northwest of London, but London has eaten it. So yeah. it, it doesn't exist anymore. Like, you know, because there, there's like a an Essex and 
there was a, a so yeah yeah and a sussex and so there was a middlesex mm-hmm. uh anyway uh, so yeah there is a mason's hall yeah named after him which i think is cool so shout out uh, shout yeah. out to ansgar the staller i didn't actually think there was a monument to him but that's really cool because that name is just fan fucking tastic and i and feel like, like as a southwark resident i deserve one yeah you know yeah, there need yeah there needs to be like a uh you know um a bronze statue of four like shirtless twinks carry, uh, yes. carrying him in a litter and one guy fanning him and him like you know pointing pointing out places in the city where yeah yeah where, yeah that's what you need yeah um but also here we start to see something um which is uh, the fierce opposition to Norman rule, mm-hmm. but it's incredibly uncoordinated. Yep. And <laughs> it doesn't work if you don't all do it together. Yeah, and it's it's a really interesting thing, right? Because one of the things, as we're going to get to later, about pre-Norman England is it's super bureaucratic and really well-administrated in a lot of ways, like we've got a surprising amount of documentation uh, from the time that everybody becomes literate in the period, mm-hmm. right? And and you know, like uh, the shires, as they are, you know, system like we're, mm-hmm. we're still we're still using that, you know, <laughs> because it, it's pretty good, like and, and it works out pretty well, right? But they couldn't use that or leverage that in any way, shape, or form to put up very much of a united front and i mean i think part of that is testament to how badly hastings went right so you know we've we've lost a lot of guys there's a lot of dudes who ordinarily would have been called in to kind of like bring things together there are also some dudes who are just like fuck it you know like there's invasions that happen all the time buddy i don't really give a fuck like i'm ready to just like (laughs) throw my sword down and just like see where how this shakes out like oh it's the french this time okay you know, yeah. like, I mean, they're still Vikings. Like, Normans are yeah. still Vikings. They're just a Frenchified Viking. It's just like, how is this different to, like, the Danish Vikings coming? How is this different to fucking Sven Forkbeard? How is this different to Knut? Right? You know, so from that standpoint, there are a few people as well who are just like, yeah, fuck it, whatever, fine. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, you mm-hmm. fight the right amount to not get called a coward. Yeah. And then you go, yeah, all right. But it's, it, the kind of, like what we'll kind of get into is there's all these sort of um, ongoing waves of uh, attempts later on to kind of do something about it. Yeah. And that kind of becomes clear when people are like, oh, they're doing genocide. Right. And that's <laughs> like different, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, but we'll get to all that in just a second. Mm. Uh, October through December of 1066. The surrender, the surrender. Good God, the surrender at Berkhamstead. Probably Berkhamstead. I'm just gonna <laughs> guess. Okay, because have I told you about this? I, so it took so it, Blair and I were in this country for like five fucking years uh-huh. before we realized that Berkshire and Berkshire were the same place. Huh? Because they they say Berkshire, but we're like, oh yeah. So there must just be like another one. That like I haven't seen the B A R K <laughs> sheer one written down, and then and then again I got laughed at because don't you know that the E is pronounced as an A? No, bitch, because it's a fucking E. Because it's an E. Why would I don't I... say Darby either. I, Derby. I, I, say, I say Darby now, buddy. I gotta go there. I gotta go there tomorrow. Gotta go I... see the in laws. No, my my boyfriend listens to the show. Keep it down. <laughs> Funniest thing in the world to me is hearing an English soccer announcer say Derby, you know, mm-hmm. like this is the London Derby and then go Darby. Darby. And yeah. like, the same fucking word. So it's, anyway. fun, it's funny for me because even though um, obviously since I have sexually transmitted Darbyism, <laughs> you know, uh, and I can say things like a oat me duck, I can <laughs> support the mighty Derby County FC go Rams. Ooh. Um, by far the greatest team this world has ever seen, etc. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can see the word Derby and say Derby, but if it's the Kentucky Derby, get fucked. It, or if it's like if someone is like, oh, it's the Crosstown Derby, I'm like, every. Do time. they say Kentucky Derby? If they say it, yeah, and then I have to be like, no, it's Derby. 
I'm as disgusted as you are. I. But I can't. Like, we're going to discuss. There's a lot of. <laughs> there's a lot. I got a lot of problems with the English. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know what I like I've you know I as always I'm on team pronunciation is whatever it is Mm -hmm. but I think if somebody said Kentucky Derby I would like you know that part in the Simpsons where Flanders is explaining cider to Homer and Homer's brain just like goes (laughs) out of it cool boom and then I just pass out yep Mm. the surrender god fucking (laughs) damn it why do I keep doing that surrender at Bark Hamstead. <laughs> if we're putting you through your paces today, buddy, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean it's more embarrassing that I keep saying surrender, like mm, the surrender, the surrender at Hamstead. Oh, oh, my, why I do declare there was a surrender <laughs> at Bark Hamstead. <laughs> oh, 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 William, William, William. Fall Valiant. yeah. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, disdain for William could only carry them so far because William still had uh, the only army in town or I guess in the country. Mm. Southwark uh, will be the template for English opposition to William because while it was both fierce and widespread, it is completely uncoordinated, coordinated with no central figure or military to rally around. And so it is defeated in piecemeal fashion. For a few days, the Norman army skirted London looking for an undefended entry point, but the locals had done well and erected defense defense works all over the city. Eventually, William was able to enter the city at Wallingford and began bringing powerful nobles to his side through bribery, coercion, and anything in between. After gaining this support, William split his remaining forces in two, taking one north with him to Barkhampstead and sending the other south where they blockaded the city from resupply and effectively put it under siege, though without siege weaponry. With William's strong negotiating position and effective siege on the largest population center, uh, and with no army left to lift it, William held all the cards. Lords began to travel to Barkhamstead to pledge their allegiance, and the city of Kent formally submitted after negotiations. With no chance of breaking through the siege themselves or having it lifted by friendly forces, the Batan and remaining top nobles in London agreed to abandon Edgar and submit to William. King-elect Edgar II was formally deposed, having never been crowned in the first place, and taken by the Vatan to Barkhampstead, where submission was made to the new ruler of England. Young Edgar Atheling was not killed, but instead taken into custody while William was handed the keys to the city gate. No matter how much the English may have disliked it, there were no more claimants to be found, no standing armies left to put up a fight, no foreign powers willing to get involved, no and no King Arthur coming out from under a rock to save their asses. Mm. He didn't come back, folks. He's still chilling with the dragon or whatever um, Mm -hmm. in Avalon. Though future rebellions would break out against his rule from time to time, William had won this war-ish thing, Mm. and his immediate future was secured. He was no longer William the Bastard or William Duke of Normandy, but now William the fucking Conqueror. Mm. King William, the first of England. A couple couple weeks later, William and his army marched into London triumphantly, and he was crowned King William the first of England on Christmas Day, 1066. He did outreach to the nobility, confirming many former enemies in their lands, like Morcar, the Earl of Mercia, and giving some land to Edgar Atheling, and sparing other nobles like Morcar. Car's brother Edwin, the former Earl of Northumbria. In March 1067, William sailed back to to the continent, taking as prisoners those same lords he had just confirmed or spared. (laughs) (laughs) Eleanor, Mm. though the Normans were wealthy and had obvious military power, they were very few in number. Roughly 8,000 total landowners, according to a couple of estimates I read. How did they go about enforcing their rule? Asking really nicely, bribes, martial force, building lots of castles. What are we looking at? Here? Yeah, okay, so those are some of the things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so there's some like big cultural changes. So mm-hmm. in the first place, uh, a lot of Normans over here suddenly. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people speaking this weird language mm-hmm. that I don't get. <laughs> yeah, so basically one of the big things that they do is they confiscate land from 
you know, uh, Harold and Harold's major supporters, right? And that was a lot of fucking land, right? Mm -hmm. Harold Godwinson owned rather a lot of the Kingdom of England, which is how he came to be on the throne right. in the first yeah. place. So there's a lot of land to distribute. And the way that things are kind of working in Norman society is still that kind of tit for tat. You get land if you kind of supported me thing. And there's no more land to give away in Normandy, right? Mm -hmm. So... This is a pretty good gig for you if you were kind of up and coming and you were looking to get some land, right? And this is handed out pretty willy-nilly. There's a lot of money to be made. Another big thing that goes down is that one of the hostages that William had taken was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. Um, and he's all like, hey, that's cute. Uh, I see that you think that there is, you are the Archbishop. But uh, guess what? Now we have a Norman one. Yeah. And this is a real signal of what he's meaning to do, right? Mm -hmm. He was also really canny in terms of the places that he had attacked in the first place. Like, you know, London is very most important, obviously. But, like, after Hastings first, he goes to Dover. And, like, taking over Dover is a big deal because it's one of the biggest ports. And then he goes and he takes Canterbury and then he does London. So it's like there's these places where he's like, I have your shipping. I have the religious spot. I have your capital. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's got these really important chokehold points that really matter mm -hmm. in terms of at least what's going on in southern England. Right. So that's a really big thing. Um, one of the things that starts happening very, very quickly, though, is rather a lot of building work and yeah, bang castles. Because mm. the Normans are like, ha, 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 here we are in, like, essentially Iraq, right? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, and, you know, the locals aren't fucking happy with us. Sure, we've got, like, all the firepower and whatever. And, like, the Pope signed off on this. Mm -hmm. But this looks weird, right? So they immediately start building fortifications. Now, these aren't immediately stone. They build as quickly as they can, mm -hmm. making sure that they have fortifications everywhere. But this quickly turns into building with stone. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, very notably, uh, one of these big places is, of course, the Tower of London. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Londoners aren't happy about it. Yeah. Uh, like uh, L Londoners are not big fans uh, when you come and take over. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they kind of see themselves as the reason for England existing. Uh, what's changed? Am I right? Am hey, I right? Wait. Yep. Oh, wait. Uh, so, like, you know, you have to kind of, like, build that, right? So this kind yeah. of, this building starts relatively early, like 1078, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is a while after what we're talking about. But this is the sort of thing that's happening. Um, another thing that they start doing is just kind of building campaigns more generally. So Normans are really um, intrinsic in the movement into building with stone. Mm. So one of the reasons we lack a lot of buildings from the pre-Norman period is they are often wooden yep. or made of kind of like wattle and daub and wood and things like that. And they just, baby, they ain't going to last, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand years. We're just not going to have those things. Um, and the Normans are the ones who are like, okay, well, that's cute, but it's stone time. Like, this is what it kind of, like, means to be under Norman rule. We're building like the French do. Like, they, they learned it by watching the French. <laughs> They're yeah. going to do it here. And that is castles, but it's also stuff like churches. Right. And so that's a really important cultural symbol for people is like, where, like, where's your fucking parish church, right? Because that's where a lot of administration is done. That's the place that you go to all the time. Mm -hmm. So that that is a, a big uh, a new thing. Um, so you've got new people, you've got new building uh, vernaculars, um, you have like rather a lot of violence being meted out, but like, hey, if you're an average person, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. One big difference that is incredibly notable, and you should always bring up if people start getting waxing too rhapsodic about like pre-Norman England, is they outlawed slavery. Mm. They're like, we don't do that no more. We're done with the enslaving people. Pre-Norman England was like, ah, like, don't, what? These were our emotional support enslaved people. <laughs> right? Wait, 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 you can't take them, no. And it's interesting <laughs> because sometimes people will try to tell you like a girl boss power story about 
pre-Norman England because they'll be like, well, there were these very powerful women who owned land. And it's like, well, the same level of very powerful Norman women also ended up owning land that they were just kind of given. And it's like, and what else they own? <laughs> what else did those women own? Like, you know, kind of like the goose chasing you mean. Yeah. Like, uh, what else did those women own, motherfucker? And it's usually like, yeah. oh, several many people, right? Yeah. So... Uh, that is a really good thing that they stopped. Um, does it forgive all of the atrocities? No. No. But it is important <laughs> to kind of shout it out. Yep. But one of the things that remains the same, um, as I already talked about before, is uh, the incredibly complex bureaucratic system. Yeah. Because the Normans are like, this works. Mm -hmm. This is all flowing, whatever. Like, I'm not here to, like, remake a system that works really well and, like, try to import norman structures such as they are and more importantly they don't want to do that because they want to make sure that everybody understands that england is still a separate kingdom to mm -hmm. normandy because william yeah. is now the king of england and the duke of normandy and if mm -hmm. you start trying to do like completely like norman legal structures and legal systems over in england king of france is going to be like what's that you got up there yeah is that uh french you using french hey buddy you using <laughs> french legal system so you don't want to do that <laughs> Yeah. Right. You just want to keep that ticking over. Call yourself the king and take taxation revenues. So that'll yeah. stick stays the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is, uh, you know, the time when William's kind of going to be like, hey, what if I uh, just don't spend a ton of time here yep. in England? He's <laughs> going to try and leave. So when uh, when Billy was away, who who was in charge? Yeah. So uh, Billy's mostly away. Uh, yep. my, my man's a Norman. He likes to be in Normandy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's where he's hanging out. Um, so he basically, one of the first things he does, as he said, takes a bunch of people, prisoner, like high up uh, people, like uh, or three of the earls, like in particular Edgar Stegen and the Archbishop of Canterbury, as I mentioned. Um, but he leaves his half brother, who is Odo, the Bishop of Bayou, mm -hmm. uh, who we have to thank for the Bayou Tapestry. Shout out. Woo. Odo, we think, probably. Thanks, Odo. Um, and also this guy, William Fitz Osborne. Um, mm -hmm. And he gives them both um, earldoms. He gives them Kent and Hereford. So uh, mm. uh, Odo's got Kent and uh, William uh, Fitzosborne has Hereford. And he's like, all right, you guys fucking watch the shop. And they're like, great. Yeah, cool. Right. <laughs> so yeah. and that is kind of like a normal way of doing things. Because, like, William isn't like, yo, I'm not, I, he's like, I don't get it twisted. I'm the king of England. I'm not fucking English, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. what I, I'm going to milk this bitch for money, and mm -hmm. I'm going to use it to, like, support my pet projects because he's busy over in Normandy. Like, he's establishing this new city, Caen, um, and he needs rather a lot of money for that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, that's where, like, his head is at. And he's just like, well, I'm going to leave that over there. This goes... So, so. Yeah. I, you know, because the thing is, the, again, the locals are not particularly happy about the new Norman rulers. So it's even if you have like pretty seasoned rulers left behind, that doesn't mean that the English are going to love it. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So William is well he's going to try and be away but he keeps having to come back mm -hmm. because the pesky english you know mm. there's just going to be blowback there's always going to be some blowback when you um you know conquer someone and uh yeah from 1067 to 1076 that's what we get here in england um the next few years played out the same uh with william and or his allies playing a uh playing a game of island-wide whack-a-mole where mm -hmm. they would move forces against small sporadic rebellions that kept erupting across the realm opposition sprang up immediately with minor uprisings in kent and west mercia along the welsh border in 1067 the next two years saw only very small rebellions in exeter mercia northumbria and small raids by sea from harold's surviving sons who had fled to ireland 1069, however, would see a decided escalation in the number of scale and revolts, beginning with William's so-called Herring of the North, mm. which was William's brutal, soul-staining, year-long effort to quash northern resistance permanently. 
everywhere William's soldiers went in the north, they slaughtered English rebels and civilians alike with little care for distinction. This all kicked off in 1069 after hundreds of Norman soldiers in Northumbria were set upon and massacred by a large, uh, large force of English under Edgar Atheling and others who then moved on to York Castle where they slaughtered the Norman garrison. William and his men marched against the city and castle where many of the inhabitants were put to the sword and Norman rule was reestablished with a new larger garrison in place. A subsequent York uprising later in the year was crushed mercilessly by the new garrison. Harold, also Harold's sons in Ireland made a final stab at glory, bringing their entire force to bear at the Battle of Northam, where they were defeated at the only named battle of this period. Then the Danes showed up off the coast, and rebels across the island used this as cue to rise up against the Norman yoke, though these rebellions were, again, totally localized and thus easier to snuff out one by one. Uprisings occurred in Lincoln, Shrewsbury, Exeter, and Montacute Castle in Somerset, but the largest happening again in York. Despite Norman rebels having been crushed, or Northern rebels having been crushed by the Normans twice that year already, they somehow found more men, uh, and combined with the invading Danes, had there been any central collaboration between the Northumbrian rebellion and those elsewhere, the Norman conquest might have been little more than a footnote in the history books. But they did not, hmm. and so the Normans and their allies picked them off. The Norman garrisons and an arriving detachment fended off the rebels at Exeter with an army from London, uh, while an army from London handled the rebels at Montacute Castle. This freed up William to once again take the bulk of his army north, where they attacked and scattered the Danish fleet moored for the winter near Lincolnshire. Uh, the Danes attempted to retake the area, but were repulsed by the garrison William had left before he moved into Northumbria. William's army saw off the English rebels and Danish Vikings at Pontefract before retaking York Castle and occupying it himself for a brief time, wearing his crown at the castle on Christmas Day as a sign of his authority. The remaining Danes were paid off by William using a tax known as a Danegeld and agreed to depart in the spring. This lack of manpower effectively neutered the northern resistance by early tens of... Um, effectively neutered the early uh, northern resistance by early 1076, but Northumbria generally and York specifically were uh, decimated with lands and crops destroyed and much of the population scattered or killed. William's tactics were considered brutal and savage at the time. His, his contemporaries chastised him and his army, and they were later made to perform acts of penitence by the Pope. The Domesday Book, published by the Normans in 1086, went so far as to call Yorkshire, quote, a wasteland, end quote, with more than 60% of the land wasted and only 25% of the population remaining. After signing a treaty with Scotland in 1071, William had done it outside of some uh, rebels hiding in the fens. He'd seen off all challengers and retained the crown through brutal methods. Well, except one more we'll get to in just a second. <laughs> Eleanor, um... It's sometimes called a uh, it's sometimes called a genocide, mm. uh, sometimes called a massacre. But w mm. regardless of what it's called or the technical sophistication of it, uh, they just went in there and fucking slaughtered everyone. Oh right god, off. yeah, yeah. It and it was horrifying, like yeah. to the point where the population of Yorkshire. Some of our estimations are that it's about like twenty five percent of what it had been for mm -hmm. like the next oh five hundred years. Yeah. Like it takes it a really, really long time to recover. Um, and it, it, it is so, you know, when we talk about um, William wearing his crown in the castle, he does it um, in the ashes of the city of York. Jesus Christ. In the castle, like walks through it. And he's like literally talking about like, we will salt the fucking earth. Like how many times do I have to show you animals Dana I'm the Daenerys Targaryen ass. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's Darna it's Daenerys Targaryen ass stuff where they've like burnt York and that's and he's like walking around wearing his crown and he's like how about now? Like they slaughter Jesus. all of the animals, they yeah. burn all of the crops. They're just like, yep, this is this is what it is. There are rumors, although it's very common in the Middle Ages um, when you have incidents like this, but there are uh, rumors that people resulted to cannibal resorted to cannibalism. Mm -hmm. um and it like it is bad yeah 
incredibly bad stuff. Um, even nor- even Norman sources at the time, like uh, the mm-hmm. people who were normally bigging up William, were like, "Dude, what the fuck?" Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Jesus fucking Christ, man! Like even the Norman sources are like, "That was just a bit wild." Yeah. Right. And I mean, basically, I guess William is like, don't make me come back up here. Right. It's yeah. quite a long way from Normandy. Yeah. Um, so look, let's just say that. Um, and also, it's it's kind of a really crazy move because um, it is a really generative part of England. You know, like it's I can't stop me if you've heard this one, but it's excellent for sheep herding. <laughs> I didn't know that. Are, are there so, sheep? Are there sheep on England? On yeah, the no, oh. I know, right? So, Interesting. Um, it's an incredibly wealthy, <laughs> wealthy part of the kingdom, and mm-hmm. um, it is a little bit culturally distinct because it had been in the Dane law um, earlier on. You do, of course, like you know York itself, having come from the Viking word Jorvig, obviously, hmm. um, and like it had been like a, a quite much more like Norse sort of leaning kind mm-hmm. of place and there was rather a lot of riches and, and money to be had and he was i think everyone was just kind of shocked at his willingness to do that as well because it's such a money maker right like it's such mm-hmm. a money spinner and he's like i don't even give a fuck about that because i'm not getting in my boats one more time to come back up here right yeah. so it is a real horrifying war crime like one thing yeah. that you can say or another is like granted there's no, there's no icj or whatever but yeah. Uh, you can absolutely. call a spade a spade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, uh, as a result of this, he also is like sets up two major castles, which are Stafford and Chester, mm-hmm. um, in order to kind of be like, we are looking, you know, at this. <laughs> you don't, you don't quite understand. Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. leaving. I'm too stubborn for that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after 1072, things were quiet until, until. 1075, Mm -hmm. when the Earls were revolting. Eleanor, Mm. why were they revolting? Why were they so revolting? And why why were they trying again so late? Uh, It's almost a decade, a full decade of Norman rule and at least four years removed from the last big uprising. Yeah, so the Earls had done this before. Uh, back in 1068, I think it was. Uh, but they're like, uh, it's the revolt of the Earls too, um, <laughs> too fast, too furious. Mm-hmm. And basically, this was kicked off because William wouldn't sign off on a marriage between uh, Emma, who was the daughter of William Fitz Osborne. Remember mm-hmm. the guy he'd left in charge of Hereford um, and Ralph de Gorder, who was the Earl of East Anglia. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, basically, he was like, I'm not giving you permission to do this because that's too much money. Like, mm-hmm. that's that's too large, and I don't want uh, this to go down. And they're like, cool story, bro. Anyway, I'm getting married, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, like, so that's like, hmm, right? Then another one, like, um, another guy, Ralph, uh, who is, like, a... Uh, he, who's like connected as a brother-in-law from all mm-hmm. this um like says that he's going to get married also like to, to someone else and then they kick off a revolt right mm-hmm. from north northumberland and basically what happens then is that one of the uh earls involved who earl the earl of northumberland who's called um Walthoff, bring it back <laughs> yeah all right um he's like oh i'm just scared because william is such a fucking war criminal or whatever and he yeah. confesses to the archbishop of canterbury what is going on and they're like mm-hmm. oh shit right and so that kind of like kicks off excommunication mm-hmm. to everyone who was like disobeying orders and then it's like and then william is like bro <laughs> yeah I'm coming over there, right? Mm. So uh, basically, it's kind of like somewhat about marriage things, but also just about the fact that William was cracking down a little bit on the power mm-hmm. of the earls. And to be fair, you, I really see the earls' position on this one because they're like, you're not even here, bro. Yeah. Like, you left me in charge, and now you're saying, like, I can't get married and, like, increase my wealth over here or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, like, fuck off. Get out of here with that nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, surprise, what ends up happening... Because William wins, and he ends up depriving, like, 
Ralph of all his lads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, surprise. Uh, and it makes him leave England. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ralph just goes back to Brittany. Cool. <laughs> what yeah. I love about this is that there's often like surprisingly boring names uh, involved. Yeah. Like including uh, you got both Ralph of Brittany and also Brian of Brittany. And it's like, what's Brian doing there? <laughs> Brian. That's great. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's just like, there's, oh, there's Brian. There's Robert. There's William. I'm like, dude. <laughs> You know, this is why we need Walthoff, right? Yeah. Because like, I'm not, I'm not trying to. Yeah, that. it's, it's not time for, it's not time for, you know, uh, for Ralph's yet. You know, we we need mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. we need these old names that are, you know, just yeah. insane. Um, but like, as the the uh, fact that these guys are like Breton kind of indicates is these were sort of people like the Bretons and the Normans had a super garrulous relationship back in France. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of fighting back and forth over the border to try to establish what was Brittany and what was Normandy. Um, you know, part of the reason that Normandy was even established is that the Frankish kings were like, can you help us out with those fucking Bretons? <laughs> and, and, and things like that. So there's like a lot of back and forth about what that means. So the some Breton nobles were like, well, I'll go over to England and I'll get more land and I'm just going to like fucking stay off out of this. And then they're kind of like falling back into the same trap again. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of frustration there. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, it's still kind of connected to what was happening over in what is now France. Um, yep. You know, and we love the Bretons. Uh, they're some of the most nationalistic to ever do it. Um, they're one of the people who have like a, they have a, uh, you know, a desire to succeed from France. Um, mm -hmm. I once had a, a group of Bretons come stay with me in my flat here in London um, <laughs> because my my uh, flatmate, a Guif, was French. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you could tell with a name like Weave. And I'm not joking. These motherfuckers came to stay for five days. They brought a Breton flag and hung it out our wet window. <laughs> Th that's how much Bretons need you to know they're Breton. Right? Okay. So <laughs> the fact that homeboys were like, I'm like getting it together, bro. We're doing a revolt over here is not surprising to me because they're just like, I want you to know. <laughs> like... It's in their blood, and I love them. They're a great group of people. They make excellent cider. I hope they get everything they've ever wanted and more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the revolt of the Earls ends um, when the Earls submit to William and uh, the Danes, who uh, had a new king, a new Canute. A new Canute. Uh, he had sent out a force of 200 ships, but they arrived too late, and by the time they got there, um, yeah. It was all over but the uh, whining. The Danes did a light bit of raiding and then left. They would continue to bother uh, the English and French coast until Canute's death in 1086. Mm -hmm. um, after, 10, after early 1076, uh, things in England really die down, um, mm -hmm. probably because of all the uh, mass killing and loss of life and the fact that, you know, like England was still relatively uh, small and didn't have a huge population and, you know, had been fighting something of an ongoing war for a decade uh, with this guy. So, yeah, not uh, not a lot left there. Um but uh, the rest of William's rule on the continent, uh, most of it was spent on the continent, and he uh, was mostly spent trying to defend his French holdings. Um, mm. But yeah, uh, then, uh, Eleanor, uh, before we go, we could talk about this, and we'll pick up with uh, with old Rufus the first next time. I refuse mm -hmm. to call him William Rufus. Uh, no. England's the founding mistake of England was not going with not just calling him Rufus. Um, William the Conqueror, uh, the legend himself, died in 1087, and his son Rufus became William the Second of England, while his other son Robert Curtos uh, became uh, Robert the uh, Second Duke of Normandy. They immediately began quarreling and fought. Um, why couldn't these two just get along? <laughs> they're Norman, bro. Yeah. Like, they're just Norman. This is what they fucking do. Like, yeah. this is this is how, you know, William the Conqueror came up. It was like yeah. getting moved house to house while his uncles tried to kill him or whatever the shit. Like, this is just yeah. how it goes down with these guys. Um, they were fighting with their dad all the time. 
<laughs> yeah. Right. Like, you know, it's it's also really quite funny because it's an interesting one. I love bringing this up, right? Because um, mm-hmm. the way that it shakes out is the older son, Robert, gets mm-hmm. Normandy and the younger son, Rufus, William Rufus, is gets England. Right. And mm-hmm. it's like it's shady. Right. You're like Normandy's <laughs> yeah. the good one. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is quite funny. Although, having said that, um, William got along better with William Rufus. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, like, so this is an interesting thing, right? Because basically, it, it just causes a problem for everyone who holds, si- like, land both in England and in Normandy. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the these two are immediately going to fight. Right. Because that's just like, I mean, maybe William was just doing it to test them. <laughs> like, I don't know. Fuck yeah. these kids. Right. Like, let's just see what they do. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, OK, well, there's no way that I'm going to be able to keep both these guys happy. Mm-hmm. Right. Like they are. Ab- they're going to be at each other's throats immediately just because they're like rich little bastards. And there's no way. Mm-hmm. So. Our best bet is to just kind of throw in behind one or the other and let the chips fall where they fucking may. Like, mm-hmm. let's just get a result out of this, right? So, like, basically, uh, part of this is also like uh, y- your boy, the bishop, the o- o- bishop Odo of Bayou, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, ooh, yeah, cool. Like, let's um, revolt against w- like William Rufus more specifically, mm-hmm. um, and so. Like, that's like your uncle coming for you. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's like, basically, it's just one, one of these things where the Normans in question know that there is always going to be friction in these areas because, you know, they're Norman and they've seen what the fuck is going on over in Normandy. So how could there not be problems, right? So it's just mm-hmm. kind of like, do or die, pick your fucking horse, let's go. Yep. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, and yeah, William, uh, spoiler, is going to win, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, his brother, Robert Curtoz, uh would not uh, be killed uh, yet and uh, will be around to cause more trouble <laughs> for his uh, other younger brother um, in, in a little while. But yeah, uh, we'll start off next time talking about uh, the reign of William Rufus. Mm. Um his uh, brutal tactics, uh, maybe gay, maybe bi, who knows? Who knows? Um, who's to say? Good for him. Uh, possibly um, uh, proto atheist. Who's to say? Yeah, a mm-hmm. lot of lot of weird stuff with him. Um, but queer yeah. legend? Question queer mark. legend? King shit? Yeah, you know mm-hmm. how it is. We'll t- mm-hmm. we'll start with Billy Rufus next time. And then we'll get all the way up <laughs> leading into uh, the nor- leading into the anarchy where we will get to talk about, uh, once again, an amazing just family tree and yeah. uh, some great names. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, yeah. And Eleanor, what uh, what's going on with you? Oh, I had the stomach flu all this week, so not fucking much uh, <laughs> is uh, the answer. Um, if you want a uh, more uh, Norman action in your life, I guess I can start pre-plugging. I've been told on the 8th of August, the TV show I made about the Normans is going to be out on History Hit. So if you guys could watch that, that'd be good because it mm-hmm. gets my bosses to let me make more television programs. When they're like, oh, yes. people watch Eleanor's things, then they say we should hire Eleanor more. And I'm like, yeah. Hire Eleanor Moore. Hire <laughs> Eleanor. Hire Woo! Eleanor Moore. Uh, Hire uh, Eleanor Moore. Otherwise, I'm sometimes posting. I'm like, you, when the fever resides, I'm posting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but sometimes I just get too wound up and I log off. But, you know, I do be posting on the socials at Going Medieval. You know, go read the blog. I have things on there. I haven't written anything this month. But, <laughs> you, you know... I've been writing that thing for years. You can find something that's going hyphen medieval.com. What do you want from me? I don't know, man. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Luke. Uh, Luke is amazing on all of the socials. You can find me there. Um, complaining or, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, probably posting something stupid that I posted before. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you can find my old show. People says to the old Republic, wherever you are listening to this right now, but that is going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time.